Hello and welcome to week 10 of this rainy season gardening journal video thing. Uh, well done for sticking with it so far, uh, anyone who has, and anyone who hasn't, well, you know, you do you. Uh, we've had pretty good rain this week, which is really helping. Things seem to be growing, things seem to be greening up. So I have taken the opportunity to, to buy some more trees, and you will see see those in a bit. I'm, despite my inability to express it in my voice, I am very excited about a couple of them, um, and I hope you will be too. Uh, a few things have not gone according to plan, so that the dry spells we had earlier in the season have taken their toll on some of the earlier truncheons I planted, um, which is, you know, partially poor judgment on my part as to how set in the rains actually were, and partially just, you know, the climate doing the climate. The chickens have also done their best to destroy a few of the seedlings I put out, um, but we'll see if there's anything to recover by the end of the season. So yeah, so let's get into it. So for anyone who remembers the uh, prickly pear planting last week, the same area is, is the focus of a lot of planting this week. Now, this week I did not repeat my mistake with the Dracaena, I made a whole new one, so this is actually the same species, as far as I can tell, as the Dracaena that we propagated earlier in, in the year. I was convinced this was actually an introduced one, but it is, if I'm correct about which species it is, a more or less wild type for Dracaena fragrance, which is, as far as I know, native to Central and West Africa. I don't know if it's one of the ones that extends into the north of the country, but this particular variety is the most uh, resilient of the ones we, we, we seem to have growing, and I pr probably would have propagated it first, except that the other one is a nuisance when it's not propagated because it's damaging the roof, so it's propagating it as soon as possible before it gets that real shot of growth from the rains, um, which unfortunately led to it. it not having great survival rates. A few of them might survive. Um, I'll update you next week on, on what they're looking like, but uh, currently it's not great. Um, but for these Dracaenas, I'm planting them out along the front, in front of the pigeon peas, uh, where you saw me plant, well, I say plant, where you see me deposit prickly pears last week, and it's very much the same technique as you've seen on dozens of plants already. Strip off most of the leaves, and then shove the cane into the ground. I'm using a, a spade this time just because the stems are a bit thick, but the, so the hard pan on the soil has really sort of soaked at this point, which makes it a lot easier to dig quite a deep hole. So they should stay upright quite well, even though I'm not actually digging a hole, just sort of forcing the spade in to make a root for them. And these are a little small to act as markers because by the time the grass has grown, if it's left to its own devices, it will be taller than any of these are, so I will have to keep it relatively sized around this area, just just to keep it from uh, being swallowed up entirely, because I do mostly want these as markers. Now the reason that here I'm planting in rows, and anywhere else if I'm doing straight lines, or wonky lines, uh, is because here I actually want rows of trees. I don't need them to remain regular in the longer run, but I wanted to try rows of trees as a baffle to the noise from the road because it is getting quite busy um, recently even with even with uh, recent issues Zambia's economy is modernizing quite rapidly which means our, our roads are getting bigger and louder and, and so I'm, I'm yeah I'm, I, I'm not a big fan of road noise so so I'm hoping that I can create bit of a baffle just to soften it a bit so we can hear some sounds other than passing trucks. This isn't just going to be a hedge of prickly pears and dracaenas, so I guess we should get into what else is going in here. Now the erythrina canes I planted also aren't looking great. Uh, when I scrape the bark I see no green, which is usually what I take to mean it's, it's, it's dead. Uh, obviously I haven't done this with erythrina before, but it seems to be that way. I had left a convenient branch up in case this happened, 
So we, we're going to get that out and uh, try not to let it fall on me because uh, they are thorny. I, I think I think we've covered this, but they are thorny. Um, and we will do the same as before and hope that the rather sort of wetter soil it's going into won't cause it to rot and will help it to to stay alive. Looking better are the little marula seedlings I bought the other week. Uh, they are all still alive, even despite uh, the ups and downs of the weather and the uh, attentions of the chickens. So I bought three more, um, which I hope will make sure we have both males and females. I, there was actually uh, the leftovers of a seed in one of the packets, so I hope that means these are seed germinated, not all cuttings from one single male plant, which would be very inconvenient. But uh, if that turns out to be the case, I'm going to be finding out quite fast whether it's possible to graft female branches onto male marula <laughs> rootstock, uh, as people do with ginkgo, but in reverse. Um, yeah, so, so those have gone out along the prickly pear line. So because I uh, don't want to just put trees I've bought out here, most of the trees, most everything that I plant tends to be something that I haven't had to pay for, uh, that we're also going to be digging up some volunteer seedlings of Pachira glabra. Now this is often sold as a money tree or Pachira aquatica uh, or Malabar chestnut. I've given it the name here, false Malabar chestnut, because it is very similar and again it's often missold. But this bright green bark should, as far as I know, distinguish it quite immediately. Amusingly, at least to me, uh, neither the Malabar chestnut nor the false Malabar chestnut are originally from anywhere near Malabar. As far as I know, both of them are originally South American. They are both water associated in the wild, but of the two, so far as I am able to find out, Pachira glabra, the green-skinned one, is much more drought tolerant, which is probably why it's more available in, in a lot of Central African countries and Southern African countries, but also means it's a much better choice for somebody where you don't want to be using water or artificial irrigation any more than you know, sort of standard rainfall. Um, the nut is as far as I know, larger in Pachira aquatica, but as I've never knowingly seen one growing, I can't be sure of that. It's just, just what I've read. The nut is perfectly edible. It's quite mild in flavor, I'd say. The most troubling thing about it is is peeling off the, the skin of it, which is, is inedible. It's not dangerous, just, you know, tough and unpleasant. But, uh, but the nut itself is mild flavored, not easy to object to and can be produced within about seven years with the absolutely minimal care that I provide to these these seedlings. Also within the next seven years I will need to find out how to make rope efficiently from from sisal because the Mauritius hemp barbills are, are starting to be planted so I planted one roughly every two meters along this row, they will probably come to dominate it quite quite quickly, but I don't know how well they'll adapt from being in quite deep shade to being full sunlight, but seeing as I have a few hundred to spare, it seemed worth a shot. They are very good fire breaks generally. Their, their water-filled leaves do not burn readily, and like I say, they are they are very useful for making rope, in theory. Um, when I say Mauritius hemp, it's worth noting this is hemp in the uh, rope sense, not hemp in the... Uh, certain people might, might use it to uh, change their thought patterns way. So don't try smoking agaves, is basically what I'm trying to say here, that there's, there's, there's nothing in there that's going to... Uh, get you high, although most members of this this group, of the agaves and the fakreas, 
As far as I know, almost every part of the plant is edible. I'm still working my way up to trying to cook any part of it, though it just... It, it's quite a sort of paradigm shift for me. If you've noticed a couple of clips from a small walled garden, this is it. It's just close to the house and I neglect it far too often. I've done some work in here over the years, but but currently it's it's in a state of some chaos. So I'm going to try and bring that into, into a certain amount of order, because if I'm going to have order, it's going to be contained in like a small area, because, you know, chaos is for large spaces, order is for small ones. So the walls are covered with what is supposed to be ticky fig, but is actually a mix of three different creepers, which which are being held back. They will return, don't worry about them too much. Also overgrown are some pigeon peas that were not invited, but I'm quite happy to have them growing in the uh, in the vegetable patch in here. I just do, don't need them taking over the entire open space. They were leaning in to get away from the creepers, but as I'm cutting the creepers back, hopefully they will uh, straighten up a, bit, a little bit now. Um, I've also planted quite a lot of succulents in the wall, which is being... I thought they were being choked by the weeds, but it turns out they were actually doing pretty well. One amusing, I don't know, thing while I was doing this, it did start to rain, so you will notice a jump quite soon, because uh, I, I tried to give the camcorder uh, an anorak, as it were, and uh, instead I accidentally just covered it with a plastic bag and, and didn't record anything, which was really good thinking on my part. You'll see where the Cat's Claw and Dutchman's Pipe, which are the two more invasive creepers here, have covered the fig. It's died back quite sharply. I think that might also be why there is a fig longhorn, which may have been drawn to the smell of, of dead fig branches up in there. But hopefully once those are cut back, we, we should find it thriving again. You'll also see over the wall a bit of dragon fruit vine, which is the rather heavy cactus vine. It is actually flowering, which is the closest to the ground any of them flowering, and hopefully we will be able to, to harvest dragon fruit soon. That I don't have to, you know, wave a 30-foot stick in the air to, to pick, which, which, which would be good. And on the off chance that anyone is wondering, yes, that little low wall I'm on the other side of is made of broken bricks. It, it was building rubble, which didn't seem to have much use, but I think it makes quite a nice wall. You can see the fig is starting to grow over it, and with the succulents it's quite a nice rockery in its own right. But for anyone who thinks that maintaining is just about cutting things down, I was also planting a few more succulents in that wall, mostly mostly ones whose pots were just a little bit too too wet either because I put the wrong soil in or because they'd sat in places where rain was falling off the roof into them and they weren't thriving in their pots. These are all home propagated, two aloes, well two aloeaceae and a calenco, it should be the this uh, small more typical succulent. I also planted a rose apple I've been laboring under the delusion for a very long time that a rose apple was a type of custard apple, but it's actually a syzygium, so it's basically a large waterberry fruit on a small waterberry bush or tree. Um, I'm hoping it will do quite well here. Which brings us to a thorny issue in more ways than one. Um, that is a pun, and I'm sorry, because what I mean to say is I am about to be discussing a type of citrus tree which has a name which is offensive in some contexts. I hope it won't be offensive here, because that is the only common name that I could find for it, but I thought it would be appropriate to put up a warning even so, that if you are from Southern Africa, especially a non-white from Southern Africa, this term will probably have some baggage for you, so just be aware of that. So the name of this tree is a kaffir lime. I don't know the full terminology that a uh, horticulturist would use in the situation, but it's what I would refer to as a true lime, because this is citrus hystrix, or the kaffir lime, is a species of lime as opposed to a hybrid, whereas most of the limes, and indeed many of the citrus 
you will see in a supermarket are hybrids between multiple different species of wild citrus. Citrus hystrix is one of several species of lime which are more or less in their wild form and are unhybridized. There's actually quite a few around South Asia, Indonesia and Australia. I would really love to be growing a wide range of these. This particular species is very distinctive for its double leaf. You'll also see this to an extent on a range of other citrus, but not to this extent. On a lighter note, while I was while I was uh, burying this, I came across a large bone fragment. I'm assuming it's cow, uh, left over from a barbecue or something. But if anyone else wants to chime in and tell me it's something much more alarming, uh, I guess that's what the comments are for. <laughs> the next far less contentious plant. Uh, it apparently likes the same conditions as citrus, which is good because we have sandy and acid soil all over the farm. But realistically, in terms of light, I think is where I'm going to have more more issues uh, with what I think about what the internet says here. So these are tree tomatoes, and as with most citrus, most everything on the internet says full sun, and I look at this plant and I do not think it wants to be in full sun, but one of them I'm putting in as close as I am comfortable. So this is in a row of orange trees, which range from deep shade through to full sun. And the deep shade end is a little bit spindly, but just partial shade part is the two healthiest and happiest. And I'm putting this one right between those where it should form a nice sort of biochemical defense between the two of them. I say should here because I'm not entirely confident of my own reasoning. Uh, a lot of the time you'll find Solanaceae get a lot of the same pests and diseases as citrus, but I'm hoping that this slightly weirder Solanaceous plant won't be so prone to all the same things, which, which might be poor judgment on my plant, but in fairness there are a limited number of areas with bright sunlight and access to good good irrigation that I haven't already filled with plants. So if something says it wants regular watering, it's it's got it's got a limit on exactly where it can go. Now I'm suspecting the second one will need less water. This is actually me planting it based not on on any advice, but on what it looks like. It looks like at least in this climate, it's going to want a little bit more shade. So so this is under one of the larger Brachysteges, which does drop a lot of its leaf during the dry season, which is not ideal, but it's also in amongst a fair few spindly young trees, most of whom will eventually come out because most of whom are invasive. And so they're being kept because they, they provide a windbreak at the moment, which should certainly help with one of the problems with tree tomatoes, which is that they tend to blow over, but might also interfere with its needs for light a little bit. But we have two. I will try my best to keep them both alive, and we will see which one grows healthier and more robust. And a brief interlude between the fruit trees I spent money on for the descendant of a fruit tree I spent money on. So this is one of the first of some second generation loquats uh, that I germinated from fruits produced last year, I think. And uh, yeah, so it's going in where I had put a date palm that the chickens have killed. So the calenco that's already there should spread out around it. And it's also big enough to, to break off the tops of those calencos and put them around the next citrus along, which desperately needs some ground cover. The final tree that I splashed out on is a type of variety apricot I think it's canina is the it's a Spanish variety anyway um, I'm hoping this will be a good spot for it because as far as I know they are more frost sensitive than things like peaches and nectarines and this should be just sheltered enough by one of the large brachysteges to keep it from getting any frost damage but it should also allow it to get quite a decent amount of sunlight especially in the growing season I am probably not going to plant any of the germinated apricots in quite such a sunny position just because they're smaller and that much more tender that I feel like and in the past have seen that sun damage can be much more devastating for them. 
And finally, I wanted to mention last week, but thought that we were running over already for time. This time I'm giving up. Um, the sour plum has some quite interesting aspects to its biology, which is that it's a semi-parasitic plant, so it doesn't require the presence of another plant, and its roots will fuse to almost anything up to and including plastic. But it does seem to do better in the presence of another plant, where its roots will actually take some nutrition directly from another plant. I'm planting these out along the line of Dracaenas in the Dicrostachys or Sicklebush field. I did plant some close to the sickle bushes. I, I hope you won't think that's too vindictive of me, planting a parasitic plant next to them. Um, but as far as I know, these are not like a mistletoe. They don't tend to put much of a burden on other plants. And given that they are quite thorny themselves, this is mostly bad judgment on my part. Okay, well that does seem to be it for this week. So I guess if you're still around at this point and still awake, thank you for listening and watching. And I will see you next Tuesday. As a side note, it is just Wednesday now when I'm finished recording this. But it is still Tuesday GMT, and I'm hoping it's still when it uploads. Thank you very much. And good night.